Professor David Fadida, the University of British Columbia, and uh, your beautiful Canada, our neighbor to the north, is going to suffer pretty soon from the tariffs. Um, in any event, it's a pleasure to have you with us, David. And um, the t topic of his talk, I think, is dear to the heart of many of us because we've been working on this particular channel known as IKS for quite a number of years. Some of us have done modeling and some of us have done uh, experimental work. And um, we've all sort of developed intimate relationships with this channel by now. So I think it will be very interesting to hear from you, your perspective and the beautiful experiments that you've been conducting on, on this channel. As everybody here knows, it's a very important channel in the heart, even though it carries small current under baseline condition, uh, subject to beta energetic stimulation, which can increase current fivefold and participates in rate dependent adaptation of the action spectrum, which is a very important property of cardiac muscle. So, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I just like to say, I'm delighted to be here, and it's a great honor to be here. I'm very envious of the environment you have here, scientists and facilities. And uh, so uh, here's my talk. So uh, I'm going to tell you some legacy work to start off about long QT syndrome in a British Columbia Aboriginal population, because that's kind of how we got involved 10 years ago in working on IKS. And I'm going to tell you about a bit about IKS, which you already know, so that'll be a bit boring, but I'm sorry about that. And then I'm going to tell you about the variable stoichiometry of the channel complex. And then finally, steps in channel opening, which is new data. And uh, so uh, my story, from I'd like to acknowledge these people, first of all, who did a lot of the work. So Jodie Nelson, the research associate in my laboratory, and uh, she did lots of single channel recording. And she runs the lab with an iron fist, with the other management lab. And she also, she works with Emily, who does some of the single channel recordings I'll show today. But a lot of the work on the stoichiometry was done by Margie Westhoff, who's a graduate student, and Chris Murray, who was a postdoc in my lab until recently. And a couple of other people too, and I'll mention them at the end. But uh, as you know, to you guys, Canada is the far, frozen, empty, wilderness north. <laughs> but I have to tell you that the story really starts in the Hazeltons. And the Hazeltons are 2,000 kilometers, which is about 1,500 miles north west of Vancouver. And uh, so to give you some idea of the size of the place, and the Hazeltons were discovered by the West, that's us, in the 1860s. So until then, they had about 7,000 years of isolation, the natives who lived there. And uh, they lived in the Gitsan, and they lived in these Aboriginal villages and beautifully wooden carved things. And uh, they lived, that's actually the Skeena River, which is a, a branch of the Fraser River. And uh, the Skeena River, they used to paddle their uh, cedar canoes to the coast, to Prince Rupert, where they traded, these giant cedar canoes that they carved from the boats. And actually, we called it the Hazeltons, the Westerns, because there are hazel bushes that grow along the river bank. But uh, in this idyllic place, it's also known as the totem pole capital of the world, lots of people, but anyway, in this idyllic kind of place, they had a, have a problem, actually, and it's exemplified by this, this woman, this index case, and she'd had unusual spells since she was six years old. And then, it was 20 years later, she had an argument. She faced during an argument. And then later, during a, a softball game, she had a cardiac arrest, from which she was resuscitated. And after she was resuscitated, the electrocardiogram, which in an example is shown below, there's a P wave QRST. And as you know, the, the, the QT interval is kind of an index of cardiac action potential duration, and uh, the QT there is 500, but if you correct for the heart rate by this method, you get a QT into about 510 milliseconds. And uh, I think the upper limit of normal in men is about 440 milliseconds, and in women it's 560 milliseconds, if I'm correct if I'm wrong, something like that. Is that right? Oh, okay. So anyway, this is abnormal by any standards, and, and, uh, and uh, probably would require something done about it. Anyway, she, she got an implantable defibrillator. She was diagnosed with long interval syndrome and uh, she was managed with an implanted defibrillator. And so I'll tell you a bit about long QT syndrome, which most of you know about. 
So, you know, first described 60 years ago by a journal like Nielsen, and they reported a familial condition with an abnormal ECG, sudden death, and profound deafness. And until the registries started in the 1970s, there weren't many cases, but then genetic linkage in the early 90s led to an understanding of the role of mutations in ion channel genes. And now we know there are actually 15 types of non-mutations, and there have been thousands of mutations in ion channels or related genes. And uh, of course, this is the kind of voltage-gated ion channel superfamily picture that one sees all around. Cal sodium channels, calcium channels, lots of potassium channels. And three major voltage-gated families account for about 95% of genotype-positive long longevity syndrome, the most common being KB7.1, then HERG, KB11.1, and then NAD1.5, which is the most, le most lethal, but the least common of those three. And uh, so we sequenced ten, eight, nine years ago uh, the exons for most of these genes and some other genes as well, and we came across a novel mutation, uh, due to a substitution in the KB7.1 alpha subunit or IKS KCNQ1 and both index cases were heterozygous and it was a novel mutation at the time. So this mutation was highly prevalent in these two families. In this diagram, an open box with a horizontal line, a horizontal line means they were tested for the genotype and were negative. A blue coloration means that they were genotype positive. A diagonal line means they're dead, and a diagonal line with a kind of blue-white box means they died of unexplained sudden death. So in this pedigree at the bottom, you can see there's actually four individuals in this family who, who died of unexplained sudden death and were genotype positive. And uh, long QT syndrome is actually not that common, maybe one in 2,000 individuals. Sorry, they, they died of sudden death and were genotype positive. Yeah, so they, they must have taken some samples after. Okay. okay. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's not very common normally, one in 2,000 people. Maybe if SIDS, there are cases of SIDS may increase the incidence, sudden infant death syndrome, uh, long continuum involved, but it's not very common. But in this group, it's about one in 200 individuals uh, genotype positive. So, quite uh, common. And so it turned out there was an electrophysiological defect in IKS. These are IKS currents from wild type. And uh, activates normally. And the activation relationship, the via half is about plus 20 millivolts. But in V205M, currents are slower, the activation is faster, and the activation is shifted to more positive voltages, about plus 40 millivolts. You can see that these are the tail current time constants, and they're much faster in the movement. So the problem with this individual was that the channel didn't activate so much more positive voltages, so they'd have less IKS current. And you can see this much better in this kind of experiment. This is an action potential clamp experiment. So we used an action potential at 60 and 180 beats a minute. And this is wild type down here. And you can see at 60 beats a minute, this is actually a hex cell expressing uh, KCNQ1 and KCNE1. You can see the activation, this is the first beat, and then you get almost no summation of IKS in this relationship. But you do it at 3 hertz, and you get this very large summation of IKS. This is four, this, that scale is actually half of the scale here. So we call this repolarization reserve. A high heart rate, the accumulation of IKS shortens the action potential of high heart rate. So that's its physiological role. But in V205M, this would be homozygous, you get almost no current, and you don't get any current at 3 hertz either. These graphs show the peak current. You can see it's much larger in wild type than in the mutants, and this integrates the charge underneath here, integrates the current to get the charge, and you can see it's much greater in wild type at 3 hertz than it is in, uh, in either the heterozygous, or a mixture of DNA, or the homozygous. So, a significant physiological defect in this current. And so we were interested at the time, we looked at all the reported uh, mutations in KCNQ1 S3 domain, because that's where it turned out to be. This is V205, that was M, that was our report. And there were some others, D202, V205, 
PQ15 and S209, and these were all in the database. And uh, nobody ever studied these electrophysiologically, so we decided to study them electrophysiologically. But first of all, uh, in the open state, it's pretty crowded for V205 in this, so put a methionine in there, and we postulated the open state would be less stable. So, and that's what we saw, uh, actually, uh, more reluctance to open and a uh, more rapid deactivation of the mutant channel. In fact, all the mutants in S3 all had electrophysiological defects. So this is wild type Q1 plus E1, so the V a half is plus 19 millivolts, and D202H, the V a half is plus 47, I204 is F, is plus 54, this is R1, V205M, plus 48, and interestingly, S209F has a V half of minus 41. S209F is my favorite mutation in this channel. Uh, everyone in my lab hates it, but it doesn't express at all. And that's why these people had long QT syndrome, because actually the channel never reached the cell surface. However, if it had got to the cell surface, it's actually a gain of function mutation. So these people who had S209F would actually have had short QT syndrome, not long QT syndrome. But because the protein never got to the cell surface, they had uh, long QT syndrome. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And you can see that here. This is uh, S209F under the Action Potential Clamp Protocol. And uh, this is a wild type here at 2 hertz, almost no summation of IKS. And at 4 hertz, you get this nice summation of IKS. But here, S209F summates hugely even at 2 hertz. So it's a real gain of function mutation. And you can see that clearly if you look at the uh, currents here. For S209F versus control. Not so much difference at 4 hertz, but that's because it's already summated. Okay. Presumably, the patient with that was actually heterozygous. So, in the head case, do you still see measurable currents? And is it possible that those people would actually flip to short QT under the right conditions? Yeah, actually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that one because we didn't, I don't, in the database, I don't know whether they were heterozygous or homozygous. My guess is they were, actually, I don't know the answer to that one. That's a short you didn't look to see whether it's dominant? in suppressing channel It's a good question. I'll, I'll return to that point in a second. So, first of all, uh, S209 is shown here, and it's uh, slightly polar, but it's a very hydrophobic uh, 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 site around there. And so, we made different mutations, different hydrophobicities, and also different size substitutions. And you can see if you look at the V a half of activation, S209F minus 30, and this correlates much better with hydrophobicity than size. So for example, S209L, which is the most hydrophobic, has the most negative V a half of activation. So by having a hydrophobic residue in there, it stabilizes the open state. <coughs> That's our theory. So the channel remains open much more. So that actually was the first, at the time, was the first reported inherited LTQS in the North American Aboriginal community. And it was highly prevalent, 1 in 200. And it's known as a founder mutation because it really had no contact with the West. And so it seemed likely that that had been generated spontaneously. And it wasn't reported before in the literature. It was a missense mutation in the voltage sensing domain. And we, we found out that all, all mutations in the S3 domain were electrophysiologically defective. And I showed you the loss of repolarization reserve so that's going to affect the individual at high heart rates, sympathetic activation, and explains why this woman probably had her attack after an argument, she fainted, and during exercise, when she would need her repolarization reserve. And it's a significant imp implication for the families in this population, because uh, many of them were affected, and so children were affected, and of course, they have to be careful about taking drugs which would block their other kind of repolarizing channels. Yes? Are there any, any other people in, in that community also having similar mutations, or not just the family? Yes, yeah, so that wasn't just two families. There's actually many families. There's a, a large number. We've actually, we genotyped to three or 400 people, and so. Oh, it's the same, yeah. Yes. And is this mutation found in other communities, in 
other parts of the world? Or? Not that we know of, no. Was there something from uh, deafness? Yeah, that's a classic from internet. That was what was really interesting. I wanted to know if these people were deaf. Because you see, most long QT mutations are expression problems. You know, the cells <coughs> never get to the cell surface. So if they're homozygous, the people are expected to be deaf, according to Joe Langius. But the, in this case, the protein gets to the cell surface, but it has an electrophysiological defect. So it turns out, when we studied that, they were not deaf. They had no auditory problems at all. So that's very interesting. And my, my thinking about that is that uh, maybe you don't need the electrophysiological function for the protein. You just need its presence in the cochlea and the inner ear to subserve that function. Or alternatively, for my next slide, I wanted to talk a bit about um, IKMS and other subunits. So another, it's said that in the cochlea, KCNQ1 associates with KCNE1. But if it was to associate with KCNE3, KCNE3 is a voltage independent, described voltage independence of the function of KCNQ1. So then that voltage shift wouldn't make any difference. So but we don't know really what subunits are involved in these people. But, and we haven't looked. It would be really interesting to know why they're not deaf. Really you are always co-expressing with E1 here, right? Yes. And you haven't tried expressing with E3? No, we have not. Well, you might induce <coughs> voltage dependence because the apparent voltage independence of the E3 is just that it shifts it so far negative that it's always... Okay. Yeah, but it shifts it in a long way, yeah. like 100 millivolts. Well, you've got, you've got 50 millivolts shift there. So yes, but I, I don't know what the function of KC in E1 and Q1 is in cochlear fluid transport. So, can I, can I ask a quick question before we move on? And maybe you'll get to this. When you're when you're modeling the current for a dynamic clamp, are you assuming that the current you're seeing in HEK cells is what is present in in, in isolated primary cells? No, I'm just trying to say that. Uh, I'm just trying to. You know, for many audiences, they don't understand the concept of shifting activation to the left and why that would give you more current. Whereas if you put something in an action potential shape, they tend to get the idea, oh, okay, that's a cardiac action potential. I understand that IKS summates or towards and causes repolarization. And if I do it repetitively, I'll get some kind of build-up of current. So that's why it's really a, it's a, it's a, it's meant to be a, a cartoon of what you might expect to see. But I think it fits quite well, the story honest. So, I want to tell you a bit about IKS, most of which you probably already know. So, uh, it's actually from Jenny Seng's model. And so, there are of course four alpha subunits, Q1, and then there's KCNE1 here. When she modeled it, she put two KCNE1 for four KCNQ1. And you know that KCNQ1 alone has a small current that rapidly activates and that when you add KCNE1, it acts as a chaperone to get 10 times the current, and it activates much more slowly. So there's a shift in the activation curve, the V half shifting from minus 20 for Q1 alone to plus 20, so a 40 millivolt shift. And so that's very useful when you're trying to uh, decide whether the subunits are associated, because if KCNE1 is associated with KCNQ1, you can shift it all the way to plus 20 millivolts. So I just want to tell you a little bit about other subunits of KCNQ1 with KCNEX, and there's five of them that we know of. And this comes from last Lynn's review in 2015. And uh, so KCNQ1 and E1 is in brown. Neuronal repolarization, we talked a bit about the cochlear, endocochlear potential. And uh, we've of course been talking about the heart and its role in repolarization, uh, but also perhaps, these are their words, enabling insulin secretion in the pancreas in some way, chloride transport in the kidneys, whereas E2 is involved in gastric acid secretion, and E3, lots of chloride transport for, uh, uh, yes, and so this was supposed to show in the stomach, so that when you secrete acid from your parietal cells into the stomach, you need, uh, you take that potassium, and so you need you excrete that potassium back into the gut to continue the cycle. But all those subunits have different kinetic effects. So KCQ1 alone, as I said, are small currents, and they're very fast. When you add E1, they're much larger because of the chaperone effect. 
and the via half is shipped a long way. E2 is produces a voltage independent phenotype, and more of a negative regulator. <coughs> KCD3 gives again huge voltage dependent, voltage independent current. So amazing changes in the current phenotype depending on the subunit expression. And I wanted to talk to you, the major part of this talk, about the stoichiometry of association of KCNQ1 and KCNE1. And the argument has raged whether it's a fixed 2 to 4 stoichiometry, 2 KCNE1s to 4 KCNQ1s, or up to 4 to 4. <coughs> this again is from Jane Tang's model and shows you have just Q1 for those and E1. And an early cartoon, I think this comes from one of Abbott's reviews, this shows the two KCNE1s in the clefts between the KCNQ1 subunit. Somebody thinking, and, and, and a, a large, that group is a large proponent of the two to four stoichiometry. And this shows a little drawing of a four to four. So there are four KCNE1s in the clefts of the KCNQ1. And then some experiments I really like that other people have done that I want to tell you about, to tell you about the controversy. So I always like this experiment by Coberts in 2008. And they came up with a 2 to 4 stoichiometry, E1 to Q1, and they used a cryptotoxin, and they used these disulfane linkers that would uh, bind to the sulfhydryl groups. And so here they've drawn a model of actually two E1s to four Q1s. And uh, this is a diary plot of their experiment, and these are the examples. So first of all, they recorded the IKS current, and that's shown here. Then they added the CTX, and of course the current drops because it's blocked. And then they washed it out, the excess CDX, but nothing happened. That's because the linker was tied. And then they used this tris carboxyethyl phosphine to cut the linker here, cut the linker off, and the current came back there. And so we see the next peak current. And they, they did that cycle again. They exposed it to CTX again. The current was blocked, and that's shown blocked here. Uh, they washed it, nothing happened. They had to cut the linker and the current came back. And they did it again. And this time when they washed off the CTX, the current came back straight away. They didn't need to cut the linkers. So they concluded, oh, well, there was only two, two E1 subunits that I had to cut the linkers off. So I, I only had to go around through two cycles before I couldn't get response. So they concluded it was a two to four stoichiometry. Then 2010, Nakajo's group came up with, uh, they used a turf photo bleaching in oocytes, <coughs> and then a chat M cherry to KCNQ1 and EGFP to KCNP1. And uh, it shows a, a bleaching experiment here, and they've got four bleaching steps for the KCNQ1 and only two bleaching steps for E1 in green. And here we have a four bleaching steps and four bleaching steps. So they said, oh, okay, the stoichiometry is variable up to four to four. Uh, but then, just a few years ago now, Plant came up with the same kind of experiment, and they used RFP and teal fluorescence protein. And here, with these different labels, both on E1, they only ever got two quenching steps. So, oh, okay, there must be a four to two ratio. And I've actually got another another slide of their work, and really you don't have to look at most of it, I've shown you, described most of it, except that they show the two bleaching steps of the teal or the red fluorescence protein. And this is the kind of turf image they got, and here this is one spot, and this shows how they photo bleached it. They, I think every 100 milliseconds they, they pulsed it. And you see, it, they're saying it has two fluorescence intensity levels. This presumably is the brightest one, and that's the intermediate one, and that's no, nothing at all. So there's only really only two bleaching steps involved to bleach that spot, which is how they get two steps. They did get, when they put the red fluorescent protein on Q1, they got four steps. Okay, so they could get four steps from Q1, but they could only ever get two steps from E1. So they said obligatory four to two stoichiometry. So, we wanted to try and address that question. Actually, we aren't the, fir the first to make IKS fusion proteins, uh, but 
uh, that will become apparent. So we made these concatenar constructs. So here, we have four Qs together, all joined together. Oh no, yeah, that's right. And uh, so it gives you Q to the four with no E1s. And then we add one E1, so we get E Q4, shown by this picture. And then here we have a E Q Q, which when it assembles, you get two to four, and then E Q, which is a four to four arrangement. And First thing we did was we look at we just look at the whole cell current data, and so you recall the top line are all those those uh, ex those constructs, and here are their activation relationships. And so Q1 alone had small current rapidly activating. Yeah, we know that. And then EQ to the four expresses and it's in diamonds EQQ and then EQ, 4 to 4. And you can see they have different via halves, minus 16, minus 1, plus 12, and plus 32. And that's shown here, the black, the green, the blue, and the red. So by having an extra more and more E's, you can get the via half to shift, suggesting you, you probably could get 4 to 4, and that via half plus 20 was about what you see if you express Q1 with excess E1. And then, if you then co-express those constructs with E1 GFP and you record from the green cells, they all revert to plus about plus 30, plus 26, plus 31, plus 32, plus 33, and they're all shown here. And you can see the waveforms are also very much like EQ. So it seemed to us that you could add E1 to those existing constructs. You could add three to this one, two to that one, and none to that one. And you could shift the via half from minus 20, or minus 16, to here we go, this one, and then all these ones show. And so that shift in via half suggested really quite clearly to us that you could add extra constructs, and we weren't the first to do that. Our data fitted pretty well with UHL 2013, and uh, we used two different linkers, but we said shift in via half. <coughs> that seemed pretty good evidence that you could add extra E1. You didn't have this fixed 42, but you could add other sub -units we decided to look at that at a single channel level. And so these are cell attached patch recordings of mouse L cells uh, expressing whatever casein Q1 plus E1. And uh, yeah. And so these are all current records in response to this voltage step. Hold at minus 80, pulse to plus 60, and it's about four seconds. And each one of these would be a sweep. And you can see that the channels don't open straight away. They show a latency of about one and a half, 1.6 seconds. And they don't also open to the maximum level straight away. They usually show some kind of sub-level activity before they reach the top level. Here, 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 back pretty much in every one, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. And the, the open probability is relatively low, that point two, even after four seconds. Once they're open, they mainly stay active to the end of the pulse, and the end of the pulse is shown here. And you can see the actual little tail currents. Now, there are some caveats related to these kind of single channel recordings. They, they, they were sampled at 10 kilohertz and filtered at 2 kilohertz. And then for presentation, actually, they're filtered at 200 hertz. So I'm going to show you mostly data filtered at 200 hertz. And this actually is a, an amplitude histogram of all the events. And you can see that even if you were to filter at 1 kilohertz, you get a pretty good representation. The openings are about 0.4, this actually is 0.4, this dotted line, 0.45 picoamps. So you don't get much loss of peak or aliasing. Actually, if you filter, yeah, you should get that anyway, at 200 hertz. So, but still, we're going to miss the most rapid events. We won't see events that are you know, in the millisecond range, sub millisecond range. And that's kind of important. Anyway. So, and the conductance of these channels is about three picosiemens, which we report. So, what happens if you look at the single channel behavior of those concatenar constructs that we made? And so, here we are, EQ is the four to four, and you can see it looked quite like E1, Q1 separately. The peak of the histogram event amplitude, 0.45 picoamps. The dotted line is from the previous slide, and the solid line is three, about three picosiemens. And now four to two, fixed stoichiometry is EQQ. Now the amplitude is down to about 0.2 picoamps, and the conductance is 
quite a bit less. And EQ to the 4, the records are tiny. They're, you can't really make them out from the 0 here, but they're about 0 0.1, less than 0 0.01, if you believe this kind of filtering and data recording. But uh, kind of with the eye of faith, you would you'd probably accept, OK, they're, they're real. We did enough times. Uh, the current was less. And if you look at the chart, you can see, interestingly, that with EQ and EQQ, the latency to first opening was, re was reduced. It's kind of what you expect, because you're moving the phenotype more towards KC and Q1 alone. And uh, the conductance went from 3 to 1.3 picosiemens with EQQ, and then we didn't really bother for this one because it was too small. But then the real experiment is, what happens if you co-express with excess E1? Okay, sorry, can I just ask, what, what is the, the single Q uh, estimated conductance? Q, uh, Q alone. Nobody's ever made that recording, except we did publish it last November with, with Jan Min, and it's, uh, it's 0.09 picoamps, so at, for plus 60 millivolts. So that would be about half a picosiemens, maybe less. 0.09 plus 60. Yeah, it's about half. It's about yeah, about half that one, which is 1.3. So about half a picosiemen. So pretty small. But you know, that's really getting at the limit of what you want to record. Anyway, so we now took those mutes and re-expressed them. So now this was a four to two, but we've added e one, so it's a four to four, and that restores the conductance and the amplitude. And e q to the four, we add e one again. Amplitudes are restored and the conductance is restored. And Q1 plus E1, of course, that's just the control. It's the same. So these experiments pretty much unequivocally show that you can take a mutant that's not uh, not fully saturated with E1, Q1, and you can add Q1s back to it, E1s back to it, to make a 4 to 4. So we concluded from that that the stoichiometry was variable. Yes? So do, do you have a second peak on that bottom one? You mean here? Yeah. Yes, there's prominent subconductance behavior that I haven't really talked about yet in this channel, excuse me, uh, that, that you can see in all these records, it, it doesn't usually open to the peak level. And but but does it, isn't that the, the same spot as uh, one of your EQQs? What do we like if, if, you go, if you go back, this EQQ alone. Yeah, yeah, so... So I guess I would wonder if, if maybe you have a, a mix, mix and that and maybe some of the EQQs Yeah, maybe some of them were not fully saturated. That's, yeah, yeah. that's possible. Yeah, can't exclude that. Although we tried to use an excess three times the DNA for E1 to Q1 to ensure that fully saturated. Yeah. I guess that what I'm wondering is, is if they have a preferred yeah. um, confirmation that you saturate, you might still have some that are in the preferred confirmation and then some that attract the extra one. Cause isn't there this idea that they bump into each other on the bottom there? They bump into each other. Like it's hard to fit four. And so it's easier to fit two, so the channels prefer two. And then when you put four on, they have to cut you kinda have to cram them in there. And so I would wonder if you I don't think I don't think that's a that's a proven known fact. I think I, it's just I, I, speculation. I, I I you know I think if you if you look at EQ or Q1 plus E1, if you just express that alone, if you separately, it happily associates at four to four. Yes. But when it first opens, it doesn't do that. Do you see what I mean? So here, when you're not forcing into any any arrangement at all, it, it, it usually this is larger. In fact, if I go back to our original description here. See, we see the same phenomenon, and th these were separately expressed Q1 and E1, and I think you can say the dominant form is a four to four. So, but we wanted to try one more experiment, and we used photo crosslinking between Q1 and E1 to test that, and we used this BPA, a natural amino acid, which has about a three angstrom radius to form this linkage here. And uh, these are very difficult experiments to do because you have to you have to express the tRNA, you have to express Q1, you have to, the, the mutated Q1, you have to express E1, 
and you have to express an RNA synthetase, so four or five different plasmids into cells and try and get, so we, did, we had difficulty with this experiment, but we made this F57 tag, which is known, which is a member of activation triplet, so it's always known to be an important residue in the relationship between Q1 and E1. So we put a tag construct there, F57, and if you express Q1 with the unnatural amino acid, you can get very nice currents that actually have activation just like wild type. But if you miss out the unnatural amino acid, you just get Q1 alone. Uh, and this, just looking at this side of this block, if you don't have any BPA, you don't transcribe any, any of the full length channel, you have to add BPA to get there. So, using that construct of F57 BPA, we could get, and we shone UV at a holding potential of minus 90 millivolts, one to five of control sweeps, and then you shine UV for 300 milliseconds before each step, and you've got this lockdown of the channel showing the blue trace here, with a time constant of about a second. Unfortunately, even if you did independent normal subunits, UV still had an effect on these channels. It's a lot slower. There seemed to be a clear UV effect that you could do. So then we use that experiment, that cross-linking, with our, with our stoichiometric subunit. So we have an EQ to the 4, and then we added E with the F57 BPA, and you've got this kind of cross-linking, and the rate is shown in green here. Now, of course, there are only three available E1 sites, so the cross-linking rate was slower than if there had been four, and here we have only two available sites, cross-linking rate shown in blue, and then for EQ, there are no available sites for E1, F57 to interact, and the decay rate was the same as the UV control. So that showed us that F57 EPA, or exogenous, another way of showing that exogenous KCN E1 could get into the space in the complex, and, uh, but it also showed that the F57 BPA here could not displace any existing complex subunits of E1. And so, this is taken from Nakajo's paper in 2010, where they said, we agree that IPSP to subunit association is not restricted in the mammalian cells, so you get a, a variable stoichiometry model based on expression. So if you had a lot more KCN E1 than Q1, you'd get mainly four to fours, but if you had a lot less KCN E1 than Q1, then you could get one, or two, or three subunits. And the gray subunits here are supposed to be endogenous KCN Q1 in oocytes, that's why they're gray. And that's interesting physiologically, because in different mammalian species, the via half for IKS is different. So you would expect with the four to four stoichiometry, the via half to be very positively placed, plus 20, plus 30. And it is true, I should remember which is which, but I can't remember very well, but I think dog and rabbit, I can't remember, some of them are less positive than others, implying that they may not have a saturated four to four stoichiometry in, in vivo in these different species. And you can imagine it's a way to regulate the function of IKS. So the last part of my talk, yeah. I have a question for, so when we did our, our beta three experiment, we, we, we had to go back to the reader's access to, to try different levels of beta three. And what we saw was, was two behaviors. And it, it kind of seemed like when we, when we added a certain amount, we got one behavior and then when we way overexpressed it. We got like a biphasic behavior and we start seeing something totally new. So what I'm wondering is if if there's maybe a, a basin of attraction kind of when you when you get at a certain level that maybe you prefer two to four and when you get to really saturating levels then you get to four to four. So maybe it's you do get variable stoichiometry, but maybe two is preferable. In some sense, you have a higher probability of getting two to two than you do of uh, um, three to four. Wouldn't it depend on the amount of KCNE1 expression? Right, right, but what I'm wondering is if if you... You mean it prefers to be a bit lonely and not have four? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it just possible. doesn't like being super, super crowded. And so if you, if you have one lab that, that's not <coughs> putting in as much E1 or they have bad mRNA, and it's not expressing that well, then you tend to see two to two. In the in the uh, exogenous expression level, like all sides or uh, cells or cells, uh, the increase of uh, 
property or the change of the channel property is quite smoothly dependent on the increase. Yeah, yeah I, I, I guess that was my question. It, it's, yeah, with the, yeah. Oh, this goes back to your original. Yeah, so. so 98? So 90, yeah. So, yeah, nobody, <laughs> nobody cites that paper. <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, so we right, actually that, showed that. Point. But in any case, uh, uh, your, what, what you are saying that the stepwise uh, increase, that is more seen in, uh, in, the, in the case that there's only one by, uh, uh, subunit. So that mm -hmm. it is either with subunit or without subunit, that you see that the distinctive uh, stepwise uh, increase. I don't know in your case if it is just one subunit. Yeah, no, I think we got, yeah, we got two attached. To, you got, yeah, so, so, in like, a, like, BT channel is particularly, uh, 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 you know, BT channel with, with gamma subunit, you see that stepwise oh. change. But, um, for, for these channels, you never, we never saw. Mm. And I never seen any, uh, literature to show the stepwise change. But my only point is, the argument in the literature was, you could only ever get a right, right. stored geometry. And I think these experiments pretty clearly show that that's really not the case. You can get a stored geometry. Whether it's physiological or not is another question. I'm proving it in my sight, it's very difficult to not label them and send them. And, and that's really beyond, beyond the, what I was really trying to say. I think the other interesting question is, what really determines the stored geometry? Is it only yeah, the experiment, you flood it with, these, with uh, E1, and then you say it will be 4 to 4. The question is whether in the in vivo physiological situation there are other factors that will determine the stoichiometry, not just yeah, of course. You know, the amount of E1 that you have. Right, and, that, and that's important. But the, and the evidence that I said, stated in support of that was that in some mammalian species, the VR half is not as positive as it should be if, if they were all separated <coughs> 4 to 4 in flying. But in different mammals, there may be with different stored geometries, and that's possible. And I think that's interesting and hard to look at, but it'd be very interesting to know, because that's what we really care about. What's the real stored geometry in, in vivo? But in most real cells, there's also two and three. Yeah, of course. And it's yeah. So and there are lots of subunits in, in cardiac myocytes, and of course, that allows a more physiological regulation, because you can have different subunits aligned with the thing. <coughs> One and two, <coughs> KC and Q1. Yeah. So the last, the last bit of my talk was uh, was supposed to be about activation models. So you know that's an old model, uh, and this is the the cry em model. And you can kind of see here was the S45 linker. The old model reproduced the idea. You know. When the channel moves from the closed state to the open state, there are multiple events that are going on, multiple transformations to give you this sigmoidal kind of current. And uh, if you look at the, the single channel traces when you do a depolarization, you can see that the single channels don't open fully to start with. This is just Q1 fully saturated, or I guess. It eventually opens to the full kind of conductance level over some period of time. And so with a kind of classical shaker model of gating, each, four, each of four subunits goes through a couple of transitions, then there's a con concerted change, and the pore opens. But is that what happens in this kind of model, in, in, our, in this channel, in IKS? And so I took this from uh, Austin's 2010 paper, and uh, I've kind of changed the, the wording at the bottom, because I wanted to show the two different kinds of model. That's the model I just kind of showed you. There's a Hoshi Zagata and Aldrich model where you have four independent subunits undergoing two transitions to the activated state and then the channel opens. And so of course there are four subunits one way and then they undergo the second transition and then some kind of concerted transition the channel opens. But the other option you might have is an equivalent model where uh, when each subunit is activated, here one is activated by going here, then the pore can conduct. And so each one of these states would represent a subconductance level. So you could have multiple subconductance levels in this model, which isn't obvious in this model because you only have one open state. Of course, you can modify this model. One of Professor Rudy's papers and yours, John, uh, where you had multiple open states coming out at this point. So the last few experiments are really designed to test the hypothesis of 
Where are the open states? Are they after all obligatory subunits have activated, or are they after one subunit has activated, or fewer? And I'm not sure the experiments, I'm sure you'll criticize my experiments again, like they won't prove anything, but I'll do my best to convince you that's the case. So, in this one, uh, each voltage sensor is activated, the subunit can conduct in a subconducted state, outlined in grey. And so, this actually is from one of Jan Lin's paper, and it's to show what happens to the S4, many of you know this, when the channel activates, and there's E160 here, and uh, the S4 moves up and outwards, and so this happens here, and the pore opens. But they report this very useful mutation, E160R, and E160R, the idea is it prevents the S4 in each voltage sensor domain moving upwards and outwards. And so we tried expressing E160R in mammalian cells, as Jan Min does most experiments in oocytes. And this is wild type EQ. And here's my nomenclature, which you have to watch carefully to follow. Q star means there's an E160R in the Q. And so it's E160R, Q star, and then E is present. So this is actually a four to four. So there's four E's and four E160RQs. And you really don't get the current. It's like untranspected. So if you have four of those, one in every subunit, you don't get any current. And you can see that. This is the wild type current. That's the untranspected cells, and that's the E160R. But what happens if you add the Qs just in one subunit, or two, or three? And that's what we did here. So <coughs> the purple is wild type, just wild type. Here we have one Q with an E160R, and here we have two with an E160R. And you can see they, they all express, but they're slightly different. The V half of the green one is a, a bit more positive, shown here. The purple and the purple are the same. So one Q, one locked down Q subunit, doesn't really affect the activation. Two does, two do, but the current still looks pretty respectable. And so we looked at the single channels that underlie this behavior, and they're shown here. So here we go. This is wild type, so where the, all the S4s can activate normally, and I've seen, you've seen a few of these already. You get about half a picoamp of current, typical way, and a beautiful tail currents at minus 40. And in, in these, uh, here we have one E160R and three normal ones. And you can see the current actually is a little bit less with the IFA. And then with two of them, you know, this. And, and, what, and these actually are histograms below. So the black histogram, the event histogram is from the wild type. And you can see it. And this is the blue one, and that's the red one. So it looks like when you lock down one or two subunits, you get Less, me, less peak mean amplitude current here, uh, which we thought was kind of interesting. And I've got some more examples of that just to show you. I've almost finished, actually. This is a single one, and, and Jodine, she over, overdid it with the histogram. You can see, though, that uh, the current mainly opens a little, but sometimes it opens to the full level. You can see here there's a small bulge here, about 0.4 picoamp. So, Although, well, well, I'll show you, the current latencies were longer and the, the, most of the bulk openings were smaller, there were occasional openings that reached the full amplitude. Okay. And if you went back, when you had the, uh, where you have the black trace on the bottom for the wild type Q1, E1, you still have that little bump where you've got the two mutant Q1s as though only two subunits <coughs> Yes, because it occupies those kind of sub-levels. Yeah. And now this is more data of the two mutations. And I showed you this because you can see that the data is becoming more deranged. The channel, it, 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 it's not, it's not as smooth. Look how, how, you know, these are pretty clean, if you believe it. But when you have two, uh, we actually found that uh, the, the current fluctuations were more bizarre in some ways but could still reach the peak level occasionally. You can see this is actually the four sweeps above average. And here we've got 40,000 events of 12 active sweeps. And you can see there's a clear bulge here, less than 0.2 picoamps, but there are still occasional openings. So even if you lock down two subunits, the remaining two could still act 
activate and allow the pore to open, even to the peak level, although not very often. So that seemed to answer the question whether if you, you don't need to activate all the voltage sensors to get ion conduction. So it favored the model on the right in my diagram. And, but we felt we had to prove that E160R was really locked down, although it looked like it should, and it's a great story. We tried to move it, and we used this experiment. We uh, were down, shown that empty set reagents, this is IKS, could modify some residues when they were exposed. So uh, you get this incredible modification of IKS. And so we put a, a residue, G229C, in the outer part of S4, and we exposed them to empty set to see what would happen. And that's just my last couple of slides. So first of all, <coughs> this, this is a kind of interesting experiment in its own right. So we put G229C in empty set constructs, and they activated relatively normally in the absence of empty set. So here we go, here's this nomenclature. So here we have a G229C Q, we have a second Q that has E160R in, and of course it's it's four to four, because that's but they're in different subunits. So the G229C is in a different subunit to this one. And you can see that the activation is actually slightly changed, which we thought was pretty cool, because when you put them in the same subunit, the E160R and the G229C, that's why this looks like this, they're the same subunit. Currents are perfectly normal. So that's just, oh, okay, well maybe, because G229C modifies the whole cell current slightly, that act, subunit never activates in this one, so that's why they look normal. But it does activate in this one, which is why it looks abnormal. But the key test was here, when we expose them to N2 set. And so here, they're in separate subunits, the G229C. So this should be able to activate normally. Uh, and you get modification. This is the 15th trace and the 54th. There's a bit of rundown. But you can clearly see it's looking a bit like the data I showed you. There's N2 set modification of the current. But here, where we put the G229C and the E160R in the same subunit, no modification, implying that E160R really did, did lock down that subunit. It never moved outwards and was never exposed or modified to empty set. So, proving really that you don't have to activate all the S4s to see ion current in this channel. So, conclusions are you don't require activation of all voltage sensor domains to, so favoring this kind of model where subconductances can be seen if voltage sensors only partially move. And partial activation of one or two voltage sensors leads to partial poor opening. <coughs> Maybe that's somehow related to subconductance behavior that you see in this channel. So prominent. I also told you the variable stoichiometry model and the data that we obtained with capital contracts supported the idea that you could have a variable stoichiometry in this complex. And finally, showed you early on, way back when, that long QT mutation is an really important clinical problem for this population and really caused them real problems. And so I'd like to acknowledge the people who didn't work again. So Saman actually worked on the long QT mutation in the, in the, in the <coughs> Gitsan. Duran and Dan did the first single channel recordings. Chris Margie uh, did all the uh, unnatural amino acid work and also the stoichiometry work. Jodine did many of the single channel recordings along with Emily and Don worked the lab and Shu Sanatani is a pediatric cardiologist who collaborated with us with the Gitsan studies and Janmin who lent us some contracts. And my funding agency is below and I thank you a lot for your attention. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm trying to keep it all in mind but the subconductances also depends on the number of uh, e subunits that are present. So, is there a link between the E subunits and the voltage sensor moving? Is it possible that when you're assessing E association, it depends on, so E could be associated with doing nothing, or E could be associated and doing something. So, does E have to do with stabilizing the once the thing is open, <coughs> once, this, once the voltage sensors move, then E can stabilize it. And is that something to do with why the or it could, or it could do, Or it could interact with, it could allow interaction with the poor domain. I think that's what Jan Min would say, that's what he told me or something. 
Okay. Uh, no, I didn't know anything. I just uh, this is throughout the, the hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, or, so so by holding down one of those subunits, we may prevent interaction of E1 or E1's modulation of the poor domain, and that's why the conductance is reduced. You see what I mean? Because it's E1 is responsible for the conductance, the large conductance of the channels. No doubt about that. If you take away E1, yeah. the conductance is tiny. So you have to have that E1 modulation right. of the poor domain to get the conductance. So, uh, you see what I mean? So, uh, yeah. But you also, but there's also this phenomenon that with a fixed number of E1s present, you get what looks like this. You traverse those same subunit conductances as the channel opens during a voltage step. So maybe that, maybe that's, you've just explained it, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, of course we don't, uh, I, I guess, stochastically, when you get a fluorescent record, you see all the VSDs moving at the same time. Stochastically, so many of them, but maybe in a single channel, they're not all moving. Well, obviously they're not going to move at the same time. In a single channel. So is that what's going on? So the, it's the single voltage sensors moving, but that has some relationship. And that brings KCNE1 to the right place to modulate the pore. Yeah, it brings E1 to the right place to modulate the pore. Allows. So, so E1 is, is shift, something is shifted. Yes, E1 moves actually could, across the cleft. Actually, you couldn't really see that in the model, but that's well understood that it moves from one side of the cleft between two Q1s to the other side. So that movement from one place to another, that could be a confounding factor in all these experiments to try to measure the stoichiometry as well. I think I'm some or I think. Is that possible? Why? Well, because if it's moving from one place to another, it may appear to be present or not, depending on how you're assaying it. Like, for instance, in Cobit's experiments, if, if, if it's in the place where it's close enough to get the toxin in there, Maybe in two subunits it is, and two subunits it's not, because we don't actually have four pole stoichiometry within the channel. But in, in his experiment, my, my issue slightly was that, well, how do you know that more than one cryptotoxin doesn't, it does only bind, how do you know it only binds to one sulfhydryl group, one E1, each time you do the exposure, because they're all sticking up out there. And he's arguing probably, well, you can't get two cryptotoxins in the, in the pore of the channel, but you don't really have to, it could be, the cryptotoxin could be up in the air and the link is still, so then you'd still only get two each or two. So your idea is you, you would obligatorily get two each time? Well, maybe. I don't know. But I don't see why you should only get one necessarily. But again, I, I don't know. I, I like the experiment. I work for each other. Yes. So given that the stoichiometry is so important, is it known how much variability there is in disease, not just you know mutations within you know, the sequence, but also just how much is expressed in any given time in any disease state. Well, I guess it's difficult to record. I, I think. mean, just like how much protein, you know, the protein level changes, could they be affecting, I guess? Is there enough variability to affect stoichiometry in protein expression? In myocytes. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answers to any of those questions. Others may. I don't, I don't know. I think. I think if anybody had any data was from Jin Chen's uh, uh, papers that uh, she uh, looked at the, the expression level of uh, KCP1 and KCP1 and they are dependent on development stage. Um, so, uh, they, they, so there are variation of the uh, of the proteins. Uh, the two proteins, the variation of the two proteins, KCP1 and KCP1, they're not in sync. So, so that you know, maybe there is some some development or modulation of the cell function. I wonder what if you have any idea what the structural basis for the different conductance levels, subconductance levels might be. Is it different dilation at the bundle crossing gate, the intracellular gate? Is that how you imagine that <coughs> conductance could change? Depends how you visualize on how flexible the selectivity filter or the ion conduction pathways of an ion channel. And I, you know, double the amplitude of the single channel current is twice the conduction rate. I don't know if that's a big change or not to ion fluxes through channels and how big a structural dilation you would need of the pore to account for that. Do I you think, think it needs to be modeled, really? A modeling study would, would give some insight to that. 
if, if you can shift it one way or the other using your mutations, could you confer sensitivity to blockers of different radius? Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Jan Min had the idea that actually we know that the different activation states of the channel burn, actually the, the ionic permeability is different. So the rubidium versus potassium right. permeability varies. So that's something you could try, because is there a different permeability right. to rubidium? Right. Is that different between pure Q1 and... Yeah, and the sensitivity. Yeah. 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 Those sites are, are engineered. <laughs> We don't, we don't really Just even know how KCNE1 oh, in, in modulates the conductance. Yeah, KCNE1 alone has a tiny conductance, and it goes up over 10 times when you add KCNE1. We, we don't have any idea how that's brought about. And that's a big change. Yeah, so I'm going to have to stop there. Yeah. Thank you. 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 No, I don't know the answer to that. There are some experiments out there suggested by the Talish group, I think, that it depends on the order. You can, you can get different effects depending on where you put the E. But we didn't, oh, you know, that, we didn't mess around okay. with constructs that way. Oh, so if you do, like, on adjacent subjects, it's different if you yeah, do it exactly. across. Uh, and, but that's a whole new, that would be a lot, a lot of work. I don't remember if you showed uh, uh, with those with the Q, uh, E one hundred and sixty Q E one hundred and sixty R. Did you do the expression without KCE one? Actually, we have done that. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't have the slides with me. Uh, do you have a particular question? any luck trying to cross-link Q1 with E1 backwards, did we? We tried that, but we didn't, we didn't get any information. Any other, any other questions or comments? By the way, it's, it's I think we have to consider not only, you know, I say chat, the, the, the four open, not just the physical dimension of the core, but it's the kind of also the energy barrier that exists for iron to, to go through. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to do with physical movement and changes. So when, uh, when you talk about the shift of E1 and the moon, it's electrostatic interaction and shaping of the uh, energy barrier to the pores is also a yeah. yeah. big factor. Quick question. Maybe you said it and I just missed it, but the gain of function mutation that is not expressed in the individuals with one QT. S209F. S209F. Yeah. Do you want to see the single channels? You get it expressed in your yeah. test system. So why is it not expressed in the uh, why is it not expressed in the patient? Oh, that's because patients live at 37 degrees C and we can express them at 22, and that often helps you bubble better and get the cell surface. But that's the reason. Yeah, but uh, it's a pretty great little view. And they use a CMB promoter. <laughs> One thing that I noticed in a lot of the records, and it, and it may just have to do with the fact that the current is so down small, is it, it sort of looks, this one tends to look more like almost even noise around your mean open state, but most of them look like there are additional, there are sort of super transitions to higher open. Yeah, there are. It, it predicts it's we not, actually got levels up to 0.66. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but you know, in something like you can see here, in fact, there are events going up to 0.8. But this, like, we have histograms of over 100,000 events. And there's, there's no, like, when you see two, you know, you clearly get two channels, but 
and that, that's why I like this one because if they've been a second channel, we have seen a second level of opening. Do you see what I mean? Because yeah, no, 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 I'm not arguing that there's second well, levels. We had that argument that, that, that there, are, there are no second levels, levels, but there are actually multiple channels coming in your patch. That's not what I'm suggesting. No. I'm suggesting that they're actually opening to superconducting levels above what your opening, open current level. Yeah, is. in our papers we, we talk about that, and, and actually 0.66 is a higher level. It's not, it's not the most commonly reached level, so we, that, when we divide it up into five or six sub-levels, there's two around here, and especially this one, which is really important, that's reached most frequently. As you can see, there's this kind of event here. And of course, as I said before, these data filtered at 200 hertz, so any very brief events, we, 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 we couldn't see them. Mm -hmm. Currents look horribly, or maybe I should say wonderfully, like how they are back single channel currents. We, we see, we see. Mm -hmm. Is this without KCU1? Uh, no, sorry, it should, say, it should, it should say KCU1. But you can see, look, even during the tail, <laughs> the thing remains open. So, so, so David, I'm interested to hear your, your, your opinion on the hypothesis that the different stoichiometry serves as a regulatory mechanism. So you mentioned different species, right? Based on the V half. Yeah, so I think the V half is a really good indicator. Yeah, I know, I know. So you, refer, you, you, you assume it's four to four in the dog and, and so what's in what is it in the human? That's the number one question. The number two question is how does it, um, in the same species, do you think that the variable stoichiometry, so there's variability among species, between species, but in the same species, and in the same animal or same person, do you think it serves as a regulatory mechanism that will change depending on what? Hormonal changes, beta adrenergic stimulation, what? what? Well, that's does, an it, does it play a role idea. as a regulatory mechanism, or is it fixed in in your ratio? It's fixed. Well, Nakajo's idea, their their uh, Kubo, uh, was that it, it could be a regulatory mechanism. The other thing is, so the thing is, has it been done in humans? I think probably not. I, I don't know of any data, but you know how difficult it is because the open probability is only about 0.2 after eight seconds. So if you actually wanted to get a really a proper curve. I can't imagine a, a cardiac myocyte you have to be pulsing it to plus 100 millivolts for 15 seconds or 20 seconds to get the proper V a half. You know, wait, there aren't many mammalian cardiac myocytes you can treat like that. So it also, when you look at the data literature, you have to consider, did they pulse it for long enough or was it just an isochronal activation curve? You know, so you have to look, and I, to be honest, I haven't done that myself, I probably should. But, you know, you have to be pretty skeptical because the open probability of this thing is so low. And, you, know, you can't really thrash my sites like that and expect to get away with it for 10 or 15 pulses that you need to construct. I've never because, seen it because in any cell type where people have really gone to yeah. a full activation. Yeah. 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 Well, Do you so know what the V1 is? Well, we want to have, I, I, so as just David pointed out, we want to have um, sometimes it's very hard to just to use it as a, as, as a, as a hard uh, um, uh, criteria because it depends on how much the, how long the pulse you use. Yeah, and sure, sure. Yeah, because it never gets to steady state. No, it never sure. does. Yeah, but there is another way uh, that actually can show um, uh, that the, in, in, in cardiomyocytes, in many species, in uh, human IPSC cell, for example, that was shown by uh, Rocky Cass and uh, Ming Li. When they use a drug called ML277, that this drug in the exogenous expression system can increase KCNQ1 current, but it, it can also increase IKS, so-called IKS current once you have KCNQ1. But it doesn't increase the current when KCNQ1 is saturated. So that it means that if the story commentary of a KCNQ1, one is a saturating, it has no way to uh, to increase the current. And so now, the only, it only can increase current when KCNQ1 is not saturated. And then this drug actually can increase IKS current in human IPSC cell, and it can increase in, in guinea pig cells, uh, cardiomyocytes, 
uh, we haven't tried the dog, but we tried the uh, guinea pig, um, and uh, uh, they tried the uh, uh, IPSC, and I think Jimmy Chen's lab also tried the guinea pig. So, so um, all these data show that in these, at, the, at least in these cells, the IKS channel doesn't have four to four stoic monitor. But it increases the amplitude. It doesn't shift the voltage. It so it shifts very little. It doesn't shift much. Yeah. But I think. I mean, I think. Doesn't Jeannie Cheng think that that's got to do with you get more current because you get more on the surface? Uh, well, she might think so, but uh, uh -huh. uh, but it's not. It's not the case. It's a. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, I mean, in our hand, at least uh -huh. in our hands, uh -huh. it's not the, just the expression of it. It's a. Uh, it's. Uh -huh. It has to do with something that. To increase the coupling between the volume sensor and the field. Okay. These are all interesting questions. Yeah. Is there late adaptation even in the absence of beta of your energetic signaling? And how fast do you have to be going to start to see that? Right, you mean summation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in the absence. Uh, like if you just pace, you know, different. Well, in our system, there was. Uh, it probably maybe twice, 120 a minute, or more, I think, you'd start to get uh, summation of current, significant summation of current. And no, you don't need beta. And, but you know, it's an artificial system in that sense. It's not a myocyte. I don't know it's not a myocyte. Well, the, the, the interesting thing is that you don't get the effect of beta adrenergic stimulation unless you have E1 there. Mm -hmm. There is no beta adrenergic effect if you don't have E1. Now, the question is, do you get beta adrenergic effect if you have one E1 or two E1 or three or four? Does it change with the level of E1? I can answer that question. I mean, these are all these are all very intricate questions, and, and the answer is you, you still get you, you only need one E1 <coughs> to get uh, beta adrenergic stimulation. It doesn't change because the idea comes to mind, of course, that uh, you know stoichiometries could be a universal mechanism of regulation if we know how they are determined. And how they're affected by things like beta adrenergic stimulus. So it's a big question. Yeah, I mean, that idea was certainly suggested here when the discovery of KCN2 and 3 was, was made that they have different effects. If they're, co they're, and if they're exactly. competitive. But and the fact that they move, um, I mean, Jimmy Cheng has direct data that says they assemble at the membrane, right? So it's not like some other channels where the accessory subject yes. is. Well, we don't know, for example, beta adrenergic stimulation. Right. Uh -huh. You know, phosphorylate serine yeah. 27 on, on the end terminus. Would that affect the yeah. stoichiometry? Would it affect E1? Is it, you know, we don't know. But it's true, you can't displace already, you know, in our experiments, we couldn't displace, using the BPA experiment, any existing e, e, EQ to the 4. You couldn't displace any E1s from that existing complex. So uh -huh. once it had a set, well, it wasn't variable uh -huh. in our experiment. Okay, I think we're ending on the note that much more work needs to be done, so maybe it's a good one. Thank you, David. Thank you.